Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today, I'm going to be speaking with C. Thomas Perry. He experienced an NDE, which is a near-death experience, and it had an amazing impact on his life, enough so that he authored a book on it called Dying to be Alive. We'll be talking about that as well. But I just want to give you a little bit of background on C. Thomas before we jump right into the interview. Dying to be Alive is the first-hand account of an incredible experience. In 2008, he suffered a heart attack and found himself in an ambulance blacking out and in immediate danger of death. He describes the experience of being in the presence of angels, engaged in conversation with Jesus, and then being offered the choice to return to life on earth or to continue living in heaven. Now, the story doesn't stop there. He traces this back to the intervention of God on his life as he recounts the journey through life that saw him threatened by a cult, suffering the death of his brain-injured daughter. This is a story of life and death that extends well beyond our routine earthly existence and offers an intriguing glimpse into the timeless realm of eternity. The book also offers more than just a story. It opens up the way to an encounter with heaven that reaches from beyond this world into the deep heart and soul of our existence. So we're going to be joining with him shortly. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always leave them in the comments section below. I'll be sure to have C. Perry answer them. You can also email me. You'll find all that information in the description of this video. Also, while you're here, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. That would mean so much to me if you did. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm so excited because I have a guest with us that's going to discuss something that many of you may not have heard of. And if you have, you'll be amazed at Colin's story. He's also known as C. Thomas Perry, and he authored a book called Dying to be Alive. And as I said, I recorded a little bit of a brief intro. But Colin, if you can just give us some of your background, tell us, you know, what happened to you, what an NDE is, and let's just, you know, hit the ground running there. Sure, yeah. Look, I'm a university professor, I guess you would call it, in America. I lecture in media, film and television studies and things like that. That's my profession. Um, I'm, I'm a father and a grandfather. I, I have children and grandchildren. I live in Melbourne, Australia, which is right down the southern tip of Australia. We're in the middle of summer now, as you can probably see by the bright light out the back. Um, now, um, NDEs, I, I think, yeah, it's worthy of a little bit of explanation. Uh, NDE stands for near-death experience. Uh, and it's basically when a person actually dies or comes very close to death and they continue to exist. They continue to experience things. They come back telling the most amazing stories. There is, in recent years, a large upturn in reports of NDEs. I believe they've been there all along, but people are a little bit hesitant to talk about it because uh, you get a, a variety of responses when you start talking about NDEs. Uh, some people are very sceptical. Some people uh, mock it and make fun of it. Uh, but most people are very interested and are really keen to find out what happens when you die and where you go and, and how, it all, how it all takes place. So uh, my, my story and how the event occurred to me is this. This was 2008. Um, I was 49 years of age at the time. And I was, you know, I guess I'd been divorced and I was lonely and feeling a bit down and not, not really very happy in my life. And I started to actually get chest pains, you know, the broken heart syndrome. And... Uh, I, I went to the doctor and said, please, can we test this out? There's something that doesn't feel right. And every time I exerted myself or did any physical activity, it would start to hurt. So she said, yeah, that's a warning sign and, and gave me an ECG test and said to me, now just wait, relax, don't do too much activity, take it easy, and we'll wait for these results to come back. 
well, it took a week or so. And by this stage, I'd been resting and relaxing and I was feeling quite good again, not too bad at all. And I looked out the back door and my, my back garden was in a, a very unfortunate state. So I decided to get the, the trimmer out and the petrol machine and started to pull on the cord to, to start the machine to tidy up my, my garden. And uh, it was a particularly stubborn machine and decided that day it was not going to start. So I just kept pulling on the cord, getting frustrated. And as I was doing this, very suddenly I had this massive cramp across the front of my chest. It was um, a very strong cramp is the best way I can describe it. It wasn't pure pain. It was just cramping and tightness, very extreme. And immediately I knew, uh, okay, this is this is not good. This is this is a heart attack taking place here. So I I stood there and I, I thought things through because I was alone. I was in the house. Nobody else was there, and I thought this is not a good scenario. I could very easily just drop dead right here and now, and no one would know for days. But as I was thinking this, and as I was processing what was happening, I heard a very very loud voice speak to me. Uh, Internal, I think, could have been external, I don't know, but a very loud voice just said to me, you are going to die, but I have things for you to do. And I thought, wow, this has to be God. This just has to be God. There's no way known this is anything else. It was too strong, too powerful, too big. So at that point, I just thought to myself, well, hang on a minute, I'm going to die, but you have things for me to do. I, I mean, this didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time. And this voice just said to me, go inside, pack a bag, call an ambulance right now. So I was still able to move around enough to do that and packed a bag and called an ambulance. And they arrived very quickly, which was a blessing. Uh, in about five or ten minutes, they were there. And there was two. One was a very experienced paramedic and one was a, a rookie on his first day. So the rookie did the work and the paramedic supervised. And uh, he said, I'm going to give you... Um, nitroglycerol uh, tablet under the tongue and, and an injection of morphine just to take pressure off the heart. And they did that and prepared me and said, we're not sure what's happening here, but we'll get you into the ambulance and take you to hospital and check it out properly. So they put me on the gurney and trolled me into the ambulance and away we went towards the hospital. And just a, a couple of kilometres down the road, um, the, the rookie paramedic said to me, we're going to give you another uh, injection of morphine, a little more nitroglycerol just to lower your blood pressure. I said, fine, and they injected me again, and immediately uh, I felt I was going to pass out. I've passed out several times in my life, but I could just feel it coming, and I said, I'm going. I could feel myself going. And then suddenly there was blackness. That was it. It was just black. Now, as I said, I've passed out a few times in my life. I know what it's like, but this was something entirely different. Uh, I was very alert. Uh, it was a very floaty, dreamlike experience. I was simply floating in this darkness, feeling very light and feeling feeling quite content and happy in that state. It was it was a lovely feeling at first. I felt this is beautiful. I could I could handle more of this. And then as I started to drift around in this, in this black environment that felt very much like being in water, felt as if I was floating in water, and I started to think to myself, this is not normal. This is not like I've just fainted. Something's different here. And I said to myself, I think I have died. I think I am dead. And it, with that thought came a fair amount of fear. So I... I started to become afraid. And as I did, I started to have this sensation of sinking, sinking downwards into this darkness. And hence, I got more afraid. And the more afraid I got, the more I sunk. And uh, I made the mistake of looking down. Never looked down. <laughs> I looked downwards and I just sensed this deep, infinitely deep black pit, this black nothingness beneath me that just, it was very frightening. Uh, it was literally a void of nothingness, and I knew it wasn't going to be good if I sunk down into this black void. 
so that I, I brought up a Christian and I've been a Christian for most of my life. So I just cried out. I just said, Jesus, come and save me. With all of my strength, I just cried this out. I continued to float and continued to drop down and was getting quite concerned at this stage when suddenly uh, this hand came and just grabbed me by the forearm and started to pull me upward. I had a very strong sense of up and down. So uh, I was being pulled up by the wrist and I looked up and I saw this person in a, in a white sort of gown and we were just flying upwards at an incredible rate. I don't know if your viewers have ever seen that Star Trek and going into warp mode. It, it very much felt like that. I was just flying upwards and things were blurring past me. I have no idea what it was, stars or it was too quick. It was too fast for me to comprehend what was going on. And this went on for what felt like a minute or so. And eventually we came to rest and, and it was a, a light, cloudy sort of environment. And everything was glowing a little bit. And um, as, as I adjusted to being in this environment, I realised there was half a dozen also angels standing around me uh, and this one being who came to get me was also there. So I was just initially in a little bit of shock, just going, wow, where am I and what's happening here? Uh, and I gradually adjusted and began to sense a bit about these angels, these beings that were around me. And it was a very mind-boggling experience. Uh, th these beings were so full of, wisdom and nobility and they just looked timeless and ancient and beautiful all at once uh, very noble uh, it, it, I don't know if you've seen Lord of the Rings and the huge stone statues of the old kings it was a bit like that they just had this sense of timeless wisdom and I started to realize I am actually feeling their wisdom I could feel it I could sense it and then I started to realize I can sense their thoughts and they were actually communicating with me telepathically is the best way to put it. I could actually hear what they were thinking. They could hear what I was thinking. So I, I just took a while to adjust to all of this. Uh, and then the one who came to get me spoke to me and said, um, we've come out. You're not in heaven. We've come out to get you. He said, you have a choice to make. You can either come on with us to paradise and stay there forever, or you can return to your life on earth, but you need to make that choice. So that was quite a weighty thing to, to consider at that mm -hmm. point in time. I had children at, at that stage. I had a five-year-old son, 12 and 15-year-old daughters, and I had uh, an older son and an older daughter from a previous marriage, and that, that daughter had been hit by a car when she was seven, and she was profoundly brain injured, and I was the only parent but she had her own. So these things started to add up in my mind and I thought, no, I, I can't just abandon my children. I can't just leave them. I need to go back for them. And with this thought, I, I started to get a little bit afraid again and started to get sort of anxious and, and, and fearful. And the response from the angels was really interesting because they all sort of jumped forward towards me and said, no, 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 we, we can't have fear here. Nobody is afraid here. And they started to calm me down and, and settle me again and make sure I was feeling all right. So fear to them was something totally out of the norm. It was something they just did not like, did not want, and it certainly was not a part of where they were. So they calmed me down and I, I relaxed a bit and then I explained, look, I really do think I need to go back. I need to go back for my children. I feel my life has unfinished business. I think there is indeed things that I need to do in my life uh, rather than finishing now. And so um, this one who had come to get me just sort of nodded and said, okay, okay, we will send you back. And he turned to one of the angels and said, go and check the vessel to see if it's okay. And now at this point, this angel just drifted off and I was somehow able to see myself in the ambulance uh, lying there with the paramedics working on me all, way off in the distance. And I saw this angel float down to the ambulance and start to walk around inside the ambulance and check me out and look at what was happening. 
Uh, and it was amazing to be able to do this. And then, then I turned around to this, this one who came to get me and I said, who are you? And he said, I'm the one you call Lord. And for me, that's Jesus. There is no other. And he indeed was Jesus and looked like Jesus. He had a white gown, beard, longish hair. And I just realised who I was with. And it was mind-boggling again. I, I was absolutely awestruck with what had happened to me and where I was. And I had to um, just take a moment there and take a deep breath and say, wow, I can't believe I'm with you, you know, of everyone in the universe that I would love to be with, it's you. And there I was. Now, I need to explain at this point the, the feelings I was going through. I'm, I'm telling this story like it's all a, a mental narrative. But that wasn't the most powerful thing happening. Inside, emotionally, I was just, there was this enormous sense of love. I've never felt anything vaguely approaching it. It was this huge warmth in my chest that just felt as if I couldn't contain it. It was so big and so powerful, and it was just coming out of Jesus and these angels and filling me. And I felt just so inspired and so full of love and happiness and joy. It was the best experience I've ever had by a long shot. Uh, never will forget it. It was it was magnificent. Uh, and, and I was just flooded with this sense of warmth and love. And, and Jesus just turned to me at this point and he said, you've got a lot of grief, you've got a lot of things wrong, can I come and heal you? And I just said, yes, yes, please. And at, at this point, he actually joined himself to me uh, as if he his soul came inside my soul and he started to shift things around and I could feel old sadness and grief being pushed aside and things being rearranged inside myself. It was quite remarkable. And um, even more remarkable was the fact that for that, that little moment, that minute or two, I was actually joined to him and I could feel and sense his awareness, which, once again, something I will never forget. Um, he, he just had this awareness of everything he, he could sense everything that was happening, every blade of grass in Africa, every child in Mozambique, every every person in China, he just was aware of it all. It was as if he knew everything in the universe was just connected to him. And that was a most magnificent feeling, a most magnificent experience. And I, I just sensed the nature of God in that moment like I never have before. The things we call omniscience and omnipotence and uh, just that sense of universality that, that he is. And I finally really understand who Jesus is and what it means when it says, you know, seated at the right hand of the Father, one with God. Uh, I, I really did experience what he was and who he is now in, in that state. And that was a life-changing experience for sure. Um, then after he had done that, I, just, I was just awestruck by all the things that happened to me. And then uh, the angel returned and, and said, the vessel is good. So Jesus took me aside and said, okay, we're going to send you back. But first I want to talk to you about going back and, and what's happening. So he, he started to explain to me that there was no absolute guarantee if I came back again, I would get into paradise, but that, the choices I made in my life, the choice to, to follow him, the choice to be aligned with God, to keep up my belief, was the deciding factor on that. And that the choices I made would decide whether or not I could return and come into paradise. And that was the risk I ran by going back into the earth. So that was my choice. And then he, he took me aside and started to talk to me about my future when I did return. And he started to show me glimpses of, of my future life, uh, people, things that were going to happen to me when I returned. It was as if I was looking through a veil onto a video screen. There, there were parts of my life that had not yet occurred being, being played to me, which was rem remarkable, quite incredible. And things that have happened and people I did meet, uh, specific individuals that I did meet. And... Um, 
this was all in advance and he was just scrolling through it and talking to the angels and saying, uh, there is, no, don't show him this bit. No, let's move on. Let's look at that bit. And he was explaining things to the angels. He was very definitely a level above the angels and, and in command of them and showing them things and how things were working. So this went on for a little while. Uh, and then he said, okay, time's come and we'll send you back now. This had been quite a while. In the meantime, let me just explain the feelings a little more. Uh, I felt so much at home. It was like this was the ultimate home. I belong here. This is this is beautiful. And I could feel dead relatives. I, I didn't actually meet or see them, but I could feel their presence. It was as if I was at a, a family reunion was the feeling. Um, I just it felt so familiar. It felt so good and loving and I just felt embraced with warmth in that place. It was so good. Uh, and then that's, I think, why it was a difficult choice to decide to come back when you're in this beautiful, homely, loving environment. And uh, I knew what was waiting for me back here. So he, um, he actually really did explain to me that, that these are the risks of going back, but this is what you can do to help ensure that you come back again. And then he sent me back and I felt myself once again floating in this watery type environment. And I looked up and I could see a, a light, sort of a, a bright shining light, and I headed towards that light and then suddenly, bang, I was back in my body. Uh, this was not a pleasant return. It was like hitting concrete. It was very clumsy after feeling that beautiful spiritual existence that I was in, that, that, that lovely, light, dreamy, floaty sort of experience and clarity in my mind. I, I realised for the first time in my life I was outside my brain, the, the calculation of the brain, the double thinking, everything, the questioning, anything, the, the what ifs, the maybes, you know, all, all the mental processes just, just weren't there and I was purely myself, purely I. And it was very lovely to have that clarity. Uh, it's very crystalline thought processes that were not clouded at all and very pure. But as soon as I came back into my body, that was gone. The brain was at it again. The body was just felt clumsy and heavy. I felt like I weighed tons. Uh, and it just felt evil. When I was there... Did you evil. say it felt evil? Okay. It felt evil coming back into this world. The world felt evil in comparison to where I was. It felt dark and evil and oppressive, and I could really feel that difference when I came back in. Uh, like this, this in comparison is a very inferior existence. It, it, many people who come back after NDEs say the same thing. We think of this world as real. But in comparison to where I was and how I felt, that was far more real than this world. This world is the one that feels unreal. This is the one that feels like an illusion. This is the one that feels heavy. Being there, that was a reality I never really wanted to leave. And a strong and powerful reality, far more real than this existence. So um, that's we, we think of spiritual existence is not real, very etheric and, and drifty, but it's not. It's actually more real and more powerful and more impacting than, than what we experience here in this world. So there I was uh, lying on my back in the ambulance. I took a, a, an almighty gasp and the, the poor rookie ambulance uh, operator was standing there with the defibrillator pads in his hand and he was said, I was about to zap you. You're back with us. <laughs> And here I was back in my body saying, and I just said, wow, what happened? I must have been gone for ages. That was amazing. And he looked at me with a quizzical look on his face and he said, no, you've only been out for a minute. And I couldn't believe that because all of the events that took place, I would estimate 20 minutes to half an hour was what I experienced. And he was telling me my heart had stopped beating one minute prior. Which so they did. in itself 
They did say you were technically dead then. I mean, absolutely. Yes. You were technically. Okay. Yeah. He actually had unplugged, taken off all the ECG sensors because my heart had stopped. It was showing zero. What do they say? Uh, asystolic mm-hmm. is the word they used. Uh, so uh, my heart was not beating. I was gone. And hence he was standing over me with the pads ready to, ready to give me the electric charge. Um, so definitely, yeah, there was no question that I had died in that in that moment, in that time. But the thing that intrigues me about it is, is the time differential in that here on Earth in this earthly existence, one minute had passed, but where I was a far, far longer period of time had taken place. And it just showed me there's a, a disconnect between heaven and earth in terms of how time passes. So I don't think they're linked together in the way the way we would assume that there is definitely a different time scale going on. Uh, and once again, many NDE experiences have come back with similar stories of, of time passing at different rates. Uh, so, yeah, there I was, and, and they took me off to hospital and gave me um, the, what do they call it, uh, a stent. They did um, an angiogram. Um, they, they then placed a stent inside my heart, which instantly cured the problem. They definitely assured that I had had a heart attack. The particular enzyme from the heart was detected. Uh, and there I was lying in hospital going, wow, what happened? Mm. But interestingly, it's it didn't stop. I could still sense and hear angelic voices and they were talking to me and saying things like one said, um, we've healed some arteries, but there's one we won't heal. And I thought, okay, whatever. I didn't understand much about that. And later on, the, the head cardiologist came to see me and he said, you're a very lucky man, Mr. Perry. Usually men of your age, when they have this particular sort of heart attack, they die on the spot. He said, you really should be dead. Yeah, but, I think it's um, called the Widowmaker or something like that. The Widowmaker, that's the particular yeah. artery, yeah. Right. <laughs> so it was a blocked artery, but he also said something very interesting to me. He said, um, you seem to have had a heart attack before. We can see where uh, other blood vessels have expanded to take the blood flow around blockages. Mm-hmm. And that's very rare, but he said, it, it, this has occurred with you. And I, I was just wondering, have these angels done some tinkering in me? Is, is this what had happened? But uh, it was it was just very interesting that this this experience kept on. It, didn't, it, it gradually receded over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I was certainly still aware of and sensing these angelic voices speaking to me for quite some period of time. Well, I have to uh, ask you, it, it begs the question, um, I mean, I personally believe in NDEs, absolutely. Uh, but do you think there's a remote chance that it could have been um, hallucinations from morphine or narcotics that they gave you in the ambulance and at the hospital? What's your take on that? Because a lot of critics yeah. say that it's chemical hallucinations, the, you know, the brain. Yeah, that is, yeah, that's the standard response. Um, not a chance. Not, not a chance what I experienced. It, it, it's nothing like a hallucination. Plus, look, real things happened. Some of the things they showed me there actually took place. When I, when I had returned, one of these angelic voices said to me, um, you're going to meet this woman. She lives within one kilometre of this, this hospital. And I'm okay, all right. Uh, but sure enough, two weeks later, I met a woman uh, who I went on to marry, and and uh, we've now separated, unfortunately. But she lived about eight hundred meters away from that hospital. I mean, that's not a hallucination; that's an actual physical reality that occurred. Have angels told, told you this. The angels told mm-hmm. you this. So Absolutely. they were they were giving you uh, bits and pieces of your future. Yes, so, like, they were talking. Why do you think that they were doing that? Like, what do you what What's your take on that? Why Why well, do you I think that's different? Yeah, I think that's several levels of why they would be doing that. One was to confirm to me that this was real, and that was important. Um, and two, they were trying to guide me in the right direction. And 
the sense I got very clearly from them was that I had things to do, which is what that voice had said to me, and people to have in my life and things that needed to take place. Some people talk about it as a life contract, you know, things that I needed to complete. And this was one of them. And the other, I think, was writing my book about this. And the sense I got from Jesus and from the angels was that they very much wanted me to spread the word about this, that this is something that people need to hear. This is something they need to be aware of, particularly those people who are coming close to death or have relatives who are terminally ill. This, this is very powerful and, and very strong message for them. Um, it doesn't end when you die. <laughs> we think it ends. We think that's it. It's over. No, it is not. And there is many, many thousands of people who have experienced NDEs who will tell you the same thing. Um, so there are, I, I can't even begin to number how many there are. There's an organisation called oh, yeah. the Near Death Experience Research Foundation who has catalogued many thousands of experiences and there's a lot of commonality. There's a lot of consistency in what they are actually experiencing. Uh, telepathic communications is one of them. Um, different time frames is another one. A, a feeling of incredible love and feeling of being at home, all of those things are virtually universal with everyone who experiences this thing. Um, the, other, the other argument against that hallucination claim is that many, many people who have MBEs have them under absolute anaesthesia, which literally just shuts down the brain. There is the, there's no brain function going on. There's nothing on the dials when they are reading the brain. If it was a hallucination, it would show up on those EC, ECG readings that, that take place. But very many of them have these vivid, vivid experiences. But I think your mic the, went out a little your mic sounds a little low. Okay. Um, it was, I was fine. Just saying, and then all of yeah. a sudden it, it, it tweaked out a little bit. Okay. Well, I'll just repeat some of it. Okay. Um, very many of the people who have NDEs have them under extreme anesthesia during surgery or, or such things. Uh, and that is where they are actually wired up and they are reading brain activity. And for very many of these people, there is zero brain activity, and yet they have vivid experiences, even to the point where they come back and they are able to tell the doctor where he put his keys in the drawer, mm. or they are able to talk about things that have taken place, conversations that have happened in the room, and yet they had zero brain activity. They were hovering up near the roof, watching what was going on. So that in itself, it's an impossibility that this is a hallucination. Um, I don't think scientists really want to face up to that fact. I look for ways to explain it away. But that's the reality of what has gone on. In fact, I know of a couple of doctors who have actually come around to being very pro-NDE and researching that as a result of uh, having someone on the operating table just come back and, and said these things to them about a conversation they may have had or something that was said three, three balls down the hallway in the hospital that there is no way known they could know that. And certainly hallucinations can't explain that away. Right. Uh, so well, the evidence you, is compelling. Yeah, no, it really is. Why do you think um, only a small minority of people experience NDEs and the rest of the people that die don't? What's your take on that? Okay. Uh, look, I think it would have been, it's a very dreamlike thing that happened to me and it would have been very easy for me to choose to just wipe it out of my consciousness and say, no, 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 that was just some sort of weird dream. Uh, but let me tell you a few things. There is, I think they've estimated, NDERF have estimated about 17% of people who become unconscious in death come back and report an NDE. That's a pretty high figure. Um, the other thing is there are very many people who, from my experience, I am confident there are very many people who choose not to report what has happened to them, who choose to stay quiet, mm -hmm. for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that you can cop a lot of cynicism, you can cop a lot of um, 
angry response, which I have certainly experienced, very anti, very uh, aggressively opposed to the idea of NDEs. So I, I think a lot of people choose the easy path of just keeping quiet about it. It's just, oh, wow, that's something I experienced, but I won't talk about it because people might call me crazy. That's, that's yeah, that pretty makes much a lot the of sense. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what's your take on when you first passed away, you, you know, you, you, you left your body. Why do you think you were descending down and like, what, what did you think that was heaven, hell? Like, because we yeah. all have hell being down, heaven being up. Like what's mm. your whole take on the downward spiral portion of your experience? I've done quite a lot of reading and research and, and thinking and praying and, and all sorts of inquiries into, into this. It's a very interesting question. I don't quite believe in hell the way the Catholic Church and Dante has put it forward of, you know, demons and pitchforks and, and torture for eternity. Mm -hmm. I don't quite accept that. And I don't believe that's what the Bible says anyway, uh, if you look at it carefully. But the, the ancient Hebrew concept of Sheol, the place of the dead, a place of darkness, a place of silence. That is what it felt like. That is what it looked like to me. Um, and it was just like a, a resting place for the dead. Uh, that's how I perceived it. Hell in the traditional sense, I'm not sure about all of that. As I've said, I, I don't really, I didn't really have that sense that there was a place of torture. I know there are some who have seen that with MDEs and have experienced that. It wasn't my experience. Um, there are some others also who have, who have reported descending into that darkness and then a glowing light coming to them and leading them elsewhere. So, look, I think just as in this world, everybody's experience is unique and different, I, I think the same is true of after this life going into whatever that realm is, I call it heaven. Uh, there are very different experiences for different people. Different people experience things in a different way. They come across different beings. They have uh, different encounters in different places and spaces. So yours was uh, designed for you, basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I got this very strong sense of inevitability uh, that what I experience in my life is partly planned, partly my choices, but he's aware of every moment and every hair on my head. And, and that, that is something I'm absolutely sure of. Now let's talk about Jesus a little bit. I mean, I, I believe in, in Jesus is my Lord and savior too. So I'm right on the same page with you. Um, I'm curious about some of the things he said to you. So he, did he give you, like do's and don'ts, did he say, because you mentioned um, there's no guarantee getting back into paradise, correct? You mentioned that. Um, yeah. Did he expand on that? Did he give you particulars like your life, you shouldn't do this or you should do that? Like it sounded vague. So like, can you, can you give us some details? It was not an instruction to be a good boy. Uh, th that wasn't, where he was coming from at all. It was more about keeping attached to him. It was more about keeping in line with God and keeping God in my life. Uh, that I, I absolutely believe in, in redemption through Jesus. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that's his role. Right. And uh, what, what he was saying was stay in that covenant, stay in that belief because that is what will bring you back. He said, don't wander away. And that's what he was warning me about, was wandering away. And that, that woman I married, you know, for a while there, that was like I could have been drawn away into, into other things. And that's what he was telling me to guard against. Ah, okay. To, to be careful to stay attached to him, to stay aligned with him. That's what I believe he was really getting across to me. So he didn't give you a checklist of do's and don'ts. It was just stay connected, believe that I'm your Lord and Savior, and spread the message, yeah. basically. Absolutely. Very well put. That's exactly what it was. Uh, we have the law of Moses. We don't need that again. Um, and it wasn't thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do right. that. No. 
it, it's love. The message is love, and that's what I came back with. Heaven is, heaven is full of love. Jesus is full of love. Love is is at such a higher level than we give it credit for. It, it's at the top of the pinnacle of the universe. Love is the whole purpose of our being and our existence. And that's when I say I came back here and it felt evil. It's because I was in such love there, universal right. surrounding right. love. It's beautiful. Coming back here, that love just wasn't wasn't there, yeah. and I, I felt this vacuum. Yeah. When I first arrived back. Well, the planet's but not such a great place, especially nowadays. So I could relate yeah, to that. Yeah. So the yeah. angels, let, let's talk about them a little bit. Um, you met the angels after you met Jesus, correct? So you met, or, or you felt the hand. Jesus came to collect me. He came to collect right, me. Right. So he came to collect Very you. literally. And and then he, he took looked, me to where they were. He looked like you imagined him to look you know like the perhaps a, and a little more middle eastern than than we are led to believe by the sort of images and pictures that that we see um he had quite a, a narrow face dark beard dark hair very fine nose um i've seen pictures of people who've had NDEs, drawn pictures and they're fairly accurate um it's it's not the blue eyed mm -hmm blonde haired sort of image that we you know, when, see. When you but, described him, I, I just instantly thought of the Shroud of Turin, like his face from... Mm. Um, yeah, I've recently seen an image of the Shroud of Turin adapted 3D to how it would have looked wrapped yeah, around the too. face. And that's very much what it, what he looked yeah, like. That, Whether the that shadow, kind of yeah. flashed in my mind. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the angels. Um I'm a big believer in in angels, and I, I believe there are earthly angels as well as ethereal angels, too. Like, I think we can run into people that are just angelic, in a sense. So what did these angels look like? Were they um, beings of light? Did they have faces formed? Like, were they, did they look human? Like, tell me more about the angels I'm intrigued. They were more superhuman than human they had a human form no no doubt they had a human form uh, it's hard to describe their faces were quite elongated and, and they looked very noble very kingly it's the best way i can describe them they were tall they were big much larger than jesus right um jesus looked to be a normal human size these these guys were big they, they stood quite a bit taller than he was i'd estimate nine ten feet that's all like giants height. Yeah, yeah, but but not out of proportion in any way. Uh, they just looked very. You know, appearance wasn't the point. I, I think you know appearance is great to talk about appearance, and I can describe them. I could possibly draw pictures of them, and they look like a lot of other pictures you've seen drawn of angels. I didn't see any wings, but they were long in, in, in gowns, and they just looked. Wise, how else can I put it? They just emanated this wisdom and this depth in their presence. I actually felt like a little child, I felt like a little infant in their presence. I also felt very unclean in their presence. Mm -hmm. And I think back to what some of the ancient prophets wrote you know, I'm a man of unclean lips. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. I did not feel worthy to be with them, I felt somehow dirty being in their presence. They were just so far above and so pure. And they were glowing. They were emanating light. Um, that's probably the best I can do describing them. But the really important thing was that that telepathic mind-to-mind, -mind, soul to soul sort of communication element that I experienced that so many others do. And, and they are able to tell you things without a word. You mm -hmm. just receive the thought. Of course, there's no room for deception there because it's direct mind to mind and uh, it's very pure and you get the full sense of what they are communicating to you. Unlike the words where we struggle to get our full meaning across, you really do receive the full meaning from them when they communicate with you. How many were there? Three? Oh, more. Uh, six, seven? Oh, I'd there was six. many of them. Yeah, yeah quite a few. Quite a few there. Mm. 
And their role primarily was to do the work of like check on your vessel and what what, what were yeah. they what else were they doing saying to you at that at that point? I mean, and you mentioned fear and that like at one point you you were afraid, you became afraid and they told you fear right. doesn't we don't allow fear here. So they abated sure. your your fear, right? was it the yes. angels? Or Jesus that did that? It was actually the angels did that. The angels. Yeah. Mm. Um, they they just came around me. They moved in close to me and I could feel their influence just draining away the fear and replacing it with that same love wow. and joy. It was like they were two opposite forces and they just could not have that fear. They said, we don't have that here. That was pretty much the words they used. That doesn't exist here. It's not part of this place. Mm. Please don't be afraid. Uh, and um, that was that was a wonderful thing to think about. That that is their normal. There is no fear. Now, did Jesus of. say to you directly that you weren't guaranteed paradise when you pass next time? He he said basically to me, "It's up to you and the choices and decisions you make." Mm. Like, I absolutely believe I am guaranteed paradise if I stay a believer. And I think belief is the key. And he said that, you know, the people said to him, what, what do I do? How, how do I respond? He said, believe in me and be baptized, right? That was his response to them. But Wonderful. believe in me is number one. And that's the important thing, belief, to believe in Jesus Christ, where he is, who he is now the resurrected Christ in the heavens, that's who I believe in. I think we spent, look, the cross is incredibly important, but he's no longer on the cross. That was 2,000 years ago. Right. He's now a universal, exalted being way beyond our comprehension, right. all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and uh, that's that's who I experienced um, and that's who I believe in and will always believe in after meeting him. What other prophecies did you get during your NDE? So, so you were told you were going to meet this woman who you later met and married. Any other particulars that you could talk about? Look, it's all rather personal. Um, there were oh. I, I I did get um, I did get some glimpses of the future, and it was looking rather tumultuous, shall we say? It, it's hard when you're actually seeing an image. It's not like we have a news reporter telling us what we're looking at. I was seeing images of warfare. Uh, I was seeing images of earthquakes and, and things like that. But it was all rather fast and, and rather distant into the future. And I wasn't quite sure what I was seeing and what I was looking at. There was no absolute description that, that I received. Um, but certainly it looked like we're in for a, a rough ride. From did it, what did I it look like a movie playing? where you, you saw mm. these scenes, and did, mm. did you ask why he was showing them? Now, Jesus showed this to you, correct? Yes, absolutely. Did you did he say why he was showing this to you? Like, what, what was your take on that, being shown? I, d I still don't fully understand it, Caroline. Mm. I, I, I think he was just giving me some sort of sense of what I was in for when I returned. Gotcha. Okay. One thing he did say to me was, you're going to experience a lot of pain, which I have. My my daughter, who was brain injured, died a, a year oh, after. Oh, I'm so I sorry. Um, there's an amazing story attached to that. Actually, uh, she she was profoundly brain injured and couldn't move. Her body couldn't speak. She could make a few mouth a few little simple words, and she had one hand that was yes and no, and she could communicate with things like that. But she was absolutely mentally alert. Great sense of humor, we'll roar with laughter when you told the joke, you know. Uh, so she actually, after I'd come back a few months later, I actually spent some time alone with her and I just sat and explained everything that had happened to me. And I said, it was amazing. She got very excited and started pointing to herself like this. And I'm saying, Are you telling me you've had a similar thing? She's going, Yes, yes. Wow. When she was hit by the car, she was in a coma for three months. And um, I began to realise that she'd been with the Lord during that time. She was very much signalling this is what was going on. So that was that was an incredible realisation for me after 
many years of looking after her as my brain injured daughter to realize that she'd gone through this sort of experience. Wow, herself. that's incredible. And then when she was on her deathbed, we knew she was dying. She actually died of a swine flu um, in 2009 when there was that swine flu epidemic sweeping through. Uh, she, her lungs were basically eaten up by this, this pneumonia that she got as a result of uh, swine flu. So she was lying on that on that bed, just struggling for breath, and, and we all knew she was dying. Uh, she knew she was dying. And I was able to just look at her and say, Rebecca, you know where you're going. You've been there before. And I could just see the, the relief, the almost joy on her face when, when I reminded her of that. It was, it was actually a beautiful moment. And, you know, it really helped me when she passed away. It helped me to know that she was going somewhere wonderful and uh, that it's so good for people with terminal illness, for people who may have just lost someone. You know, God really loves people. He's not going to cast you in pitchforks of hell. Right. I think that's reserved for people who've done some really bad stuff. Yeah. Uh, for your average person who's trying to do good in their life, I think it's it's pretty hopeful that God just embraces them and, and takes them back to himself. Now, for people of other religions, because, you know, you, you've got so many of them, do you think, you know, and this is just your take on it, do you think that NDEs are designed for them and their God? Maybe they saw Buddha. Maybe they saw Muhammad. I mean, it, you know, what's your take on that? Okay. Um, look, I, I come at it from a Christian perspective, um, undoubtedly, but I've read a lot of NDEs. There's some really good books around on it. Um, John Burke uh, has written a book called Imagine Heaven, and he's just written another book called Imagine the God of Heaven. That talks about many, many, many different experiences, and, and some of in some of them, people of other religions actually see Jesus and become Christian. Like that, that happens wow. more than you would imagine. Uh, my experience was that if I had not said to him, "Who are you?" I got the impression he wasn't going to tell me. Uh, I don't think he goes around announcing who he is. And so I think a lot of people who have MDEs come to him and they see this figure and they just assume, oh, that's Buddha or oh, that's Krishna or whatever. Uh, whereas I don't think the identification, like I, like I say, he didn't have it written across his forehead. He, he was just a being. But you asked and for it, Jesus to, to save you. I did. Yeah. I did. Hmm. And, and that may be the difference. So I don't know. But many others who didn't ask for Jesus, uh, actually experience him. Wow, that's so interesting. One guy, one guy who's a particularly interesting case, Ian McCormick, he, he was stung by a box jellyfish Ooh. and died. He was gone and he found himself with Jesus and, and had the most amazing experience. He's written a book about it himself and, and came back again. And Jesus told him it was the prayers of his mother that had that had brought him to him, and his mother was a Christian had been praying for him all all her life, and when he died, Jesus honoured her prayers oh. in, in saving him. So that's a that's a good thing to know oh. yeah, if you have people with terminal illness. Pray, pray, pray. Yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely, absolutely yeah. believe that. Now let's talk about um, after this is all said and done. You had your NDE. Uh, how long did it take you to come forward and share that with your family and friends? What was that experience like for you? In it, well, immediately with my family, with my children, my closest friends, immediately, straight away. Uh, even with them, there's this sort of, whoa, you know, that, this sort of backward step and I don't know about this. Are you sure it wasn't just a hallucination? It's straight away. You, right. you cop that immediately. So I, I thought about it for a while. I sat on it for a while. I told quite a lot of people who I thought would be receptive, and many of them were. And many of them encouraged me to write this, this book that I've written, Dying to be Alive. Uh, so it took me, what, seven years until I actually released the book, of which two or three years were actually writing the book and putting it all together. Um, but it took 
a bit of time. Number one, to just physically recover from the heart attack because mm-hmm. there was muscle damage in my heart that I needed to restore. Probably took me six months to get back to the sort of a working, yeah. functioning level. Um, and then after that, it really was I had to sit on it and digest it for quite a period of time. It wasn't something that that you just come straight out with and, and blow a big fanfare because of all the things attached to it, all the, the preconceptions that people have, all the things that have been written and said about it. It's loaded. It's a very loaded issue. And uh, it, after a few years, I realised, no, this is, this is too important to stay quiet about. This is a little piece of evidence telling people that there is an afterlife and I cannot stay quiet about this. I feel I have a, a universal God-given responsibility to share this information and to uh, assure people that there is more after death. And I think it's a very powerful message and a very timely message in the world at the moment that um, there is hope. There is more than hope. There is joy. There is beauty. There is love. There is this most magnificent existence for, for those who, who die and, and meet the Lord. Uh, that's the biggest piece of information I think I can communicate my entire lifetime. Now, do you do you network with other folks that have had NDEs? Like, are you in the community still plugged in? To some extent, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mentioned John Burke, and I really highly recommend, firstly, you read my book, but also have a look at his books because they're a compilation of many NDEs. And, and uh, quite a bestseller, um, Imagine Heaven. But it's well worth reading and coming to understand the widespread number of people that this has occurred to, but all the people who've written books, all the people who've come out and talked about this, there's a lot. There's a lot. Way more than it just being a few freak cases. And these are not um, stupid people. I mean, I'm a PhD in my field. There are doctors, there, there are people who are professionals. It's not weird, wacko, freako people who are coming and saying this. It's it's some pretty uh, some pretty well-educated, respectable people who are coming back with this information. So I think you can you can trust that it's just not some eccentricity. There's right. a lot of validity behind this. Yeah. So what do you think is next for you? So you wrote the book, it's out there. Um, you're doing your best to spread the message. What What do you think is is next in terms of what Jesus said you have things to do? Like, what do you think they are moving forward? Well, I think to continue with this, uh, spread the word as much as I can, but I, I'm starting to consider another book. Uh, obviously, I can't tell the same story again and again, but I'm very interested in the sort of idea of visions, um, prophecies, things that God sends us about the future, about life, and I'm actually learning a lot more about this as time goes by. Um, I'm actually enrolled in a, a, a school, a school of faith that we, we actually run the Bethel School uh, Supernatural School of Ministry uh, curriculum which teaches you to understand God. And in my book, I talk about visions that I had, one or two visions I had. It's not something that just left me. It's something that has stayed with me for the rest of my life. And being able to tap into this spiritual level is very, very powerful. Um, they're, they're experiences, once again, that have changed my life, just being able to go beyond my body into the spirit and to see and feel and hear things to a level that, human beings have trouble comprehending. Mm -hmm. So Um, you're still experiencing a lot of the spiritual manifestations of your experience. Do you, are you still able to communicate with the angels or hear them or like what, what, what are you experiencing spiritually that has forever changed you? Well, look, hearing from God is not something unusual for people who are believers. Uh, you get a sense, you get a little a little voice that might say things to you uh, incredibly accurate, I- incredibly accurate. Like sometimes I, I will hear something about someone and just pass it on to them and I'll say, how did you know that? 
this does take place. This does, uh, I, I don't know how exactly it works. So I guess we would put it down to the Holy Spirit, the angels, whatever, mm. but there is this spiritual level of communication that goes on that is real. I, I don't know if we can prove it scientifically. I would imagine not. I would imagine God has been very careful so that we cannot prove it because mm. that would take the element of faith out that of it all. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it comes with belief, and God wants those who are able to believe, who are able to say, yes, I choose to believe this. And they're the people he's after. They're the ones he wants to communicate with and have a this relationship. It's like all tied with. to free will and mm. that God gave us free will to, to believe in him or not, right? Yes, yes right. absolutely, yes. Well, your story is is fascinating and it really moved me when I very first watched a video that you you explained it in uh moved me so much that I just had to reach out to you and speak to you about it there's something very genuine um about it and I've watched so many NDE stories not not saying they're not genuine but there was just something very deep and genuine about your story and I really hope that a lot of people pick up your book and, and are touched and moved by it. And um, is there anything you want to add in closing that we didn't touch upon or you didn't get a chance to say? Oh, well, thank you for, for what you just said. I really appreciate that. Look, I, I think a part of how this has transformed me, this whole experience, is, is that notion of truth and, and that, this God is truth. He calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth that he sent to us. And, and that notion of truth is far deeper than just not telling lies. This is a truth, an alignment with, with the universe, with God, and, and an alignment with the way things are genuinely. And, and what a lot of human beings do is we live constructing our own realities and twisting things around to fit the way we would like them to be, but... One word I've really learned to respect is the word surrender. Mm -hmm. And I've just learned to surrender to God. And this is the way it is. And this is the way he made me. And I'm happy with everything he's done. Even though there's been hard moments, I'm happy and I rejoice in everything he's done. And Jesus is just such a wonderful being. And I'm so happy to have him in my life. And I would just recommend to everybody watching this that do not wipe Jesus off as some historical character. Uh, he is far, far more than that. And I think one day when you cross the threshold, uh, you will meet him and, and understand what I'm saying. But uh, I think my advice is get to know him now, talk to him now, open your heart up to him now, and you will discover something magnificent. Oh, I love that. That's so true. And you were very blessed to have had that experience Mm. I think mm. you were. I mean, I don't see it as like the scary negative thing. I think it was a magical moment where you yeah. literally joined forces with Jesus. Uh, mm. And and now you're spreading that message. And that's a beautiful thing. It is. I, I feel very privileged. I, I seriously yeah. do. Uh, I sometimes have to pinch myself and say, right. wow, did this really happen? <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it, it is wonderful. And I just wish the best for everybody watching, that, that they could find their own experience and hopefully without dying on the spot, but <laughs> right. find your own experience with Jesus and with God and learn to open up your heart. I think we have very locked up hearts and that, yes. that's something that Jesus really works with is your heart. Yeah. Right. Now, I had asked folks in the beginning when I did a little intro for you that they can leave questions in the comments section below so um, I'll make sure that any questions that are left there, I'll be sure to email you and maybe you can pop in and answer a few of them. I'm sure people are going to have a lot of questions. I'll do my very best. Just be understanding if it takes me a while to respond. But, of course. Uh, quite happy to do that. I'd love to do that. Well, thank you, Colin. And I hope you stay in touch, um, especially moving forward if you decide to write another book or something like definitely let's stay in touch. I would love that. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, Colin. Have a blessed one.